I only printed about 25 of them or so, so just kind of scatter them around and we'll... Uh... All right, if we can get everybody to take a seat. Uh... Our schedules get all kind of off when uh, the preacher goes overtime, so we'll have to get on to him about that. If your Bible's right, be turning to the book of Numbers. We're going to be uh, briefly looking at the last chapter, and then as I had uh, mentioned last week, what I want to do is uh, spend some time going kind of back through the book. Um, I've got Roy kind of handing out a, a, a page that is uh, pretty simplistic, but it's got an outline of the book and then a map on the inside and then, and then the little numbers table in the back. I'll put this one online as well, but all the slides that I've been uh, putting together uh, are also on our website, so if you have any trouble getting to them, let me know. I can email them to you or whatever. Um, as we think about this transition that we've had, this uh, group of people, uh, numbers, and the journey where it started from Sinai, where we left off in Exodus, 38 years in the wilderness, then going up and starting that conquering of the promised land, changing people, a lot of different things that have come to play in this book. A lot of familiar stories, but hopefully ones some occasionally that weren't so familiar. I've had a number of people say that uh, you know it's a, it's a tough book to read. You know when you're just kind of reading through the Bible, and you start with Genesis and go on, you get to Numbers, and it's really tempting when you get to that first chapter to go skip. <laughs> you know, just kind of pop over it because it's uh, uh, it's got a lot of repetition and those kinds of things, and and, and sometimes we miss some of the things that are buried deep inside. As we get to this last chapter, it's kind of interesting because the children of Israel have been now already having some conquering. They've had some things come and go about their inheritance in the land. Um, These are people who were formerly slaves, right? And now that's the children of slaves. What have they been used to owning during the last 40 years? Nothing. Whatever they had, their clothes on their back and the tent they were carrying, right? How about their previous life? Previous life, what? And with the Egyptians, yeah. I mean, in the previous life, what did they own? Nothing. Then they had what the Egyptians gave them, so that was a lot of stuff. But I think that was kind of a problem when they first came out. Was how much stuff they had. That's still a problem today, isn't it? So we uh, we're thinking about moving from our house, but every time we think about it, we look at it. We've been there for 26 years, and there's just too much stuff to move. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna just die in the house and let my kids take care of it. That's my plan. They're gone. I can say that. But when they got near this point in the wilderness, this last chapter, if you remember, there was some girls whose dad, they approached Moses and said, hey, we got a problem here because dad didn't have any sons. And we don't want his name to be lost. And so we want an inheritance. And they rearranged and said, okay, we got to change the laws of inheritance so that uh, if there are no male heirs, then the sisters uh, can, can inherit. But there was a little problem with that. It said the heads of the father's households of the family of the sons of Gilead, uh, the son of Machra, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the son of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the leaders and the heads of the father's households. And they said, the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land by lot to the sons of Israel as an inheritance. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophad our brother, to his daughters. But if they marry one of the other tribes of the sons of Israel, their inheritance will be withdrawn from the inheritance of our fathers and will be added to the inheritance of the tribe to which they belong. Thus it will be withdrawn from our allotted inheritance. Why was this a a problem? These folks are saying, we got a problem. Fine, let the girls inherit. And then they're going to marry some bloke down from the tribe of Judah and uh, suddenly Judah is going to have part of our land what's wrong with that what's that okay yeah you know they didn't want to lose anything this is an agricultural society land equals wealth land equals opportunity right and so the tribes as you can see from this exchange were they a unified group of people all for one one for all kind of thing yet not not in the least. And it turns out that was a tough thing to achieve no matter what. 
Uh, it wasn't until David and Solomon that that kind of got put together. And how long did it hold together? 80 years about, that was it. Uh, 120 if you count Saul in there as well. But uh, then we went to a divided kingdom. And even there, there were sub-factions and breakups. So the other thing was they'd already had laws about this jubilee. And thanks to uh, Colin, who pointed out to me that I, I miss, uh, said that last week or week before, I had said 70 years. It's not 70 years, it's 50 years. It's seven periods of seven plus one. So you get 49 plus one is 50. So uh, you'll excuse me for just getting a little in- exuberant with the sevens there. Um, but every 50 years in the Jubilee, what happened to all of the land? It reverted. You see, they couldn't sell the land. They could only sort of lease it. And the value that they could lease it for was based on how soon it was to the next Jubilee. If it was 50 years, right afterwards, it was worth more. If there's only a year left, well, you were only going to be able to you know, work it for a year before you had to return the land. And therefore, it was not worth as much from a, from a lease standpoint. Um, so they're worried about this land disappearing. And easy cure. So when the uh, uh, jubilee of the sons of Israel comes and their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe. So Moses commands the sons of Israel according to the word of the Lord saying, the tribe of the sons of Joseph are right in their statements. This is what the Lord has commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophad. Let them marry whom they wish, only they must marry within the family of the tribes of their father. So as long as you have a big tribe, lots of people to choose from, not allowed to do the Romeo and Juliet thing where they get to pick from you know, some other place. Uh, but quite often, how were marriages come about back then anyway? They're arranged, okay? So somebody in the family is going to wind up arranging their marriage, and so the idea is, okay, we've got to keep it in the family, and then that keeps it fixed. So that's kind of interesting as sort of the last way that this book, ha- or the last topic this book covers And down there in verse 10, it says, Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the daughters of Zelophad did. Which I found interesting because now they were the ones who brought up this inequity. But they said, you know what? If that's the rules, we're going to follow the rules. They they accomplished and did what they were asked to do. Does that seem like a strange place to end the book of Numbers? Anybody ever thought of that that way? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird in the way I think about things. But I always think about why does it begin the way it does, and why does it end the way it does? Because this was a distinct group of things. And I find that, as I think about it, it begins by counting a lot of people. There were these hordes that came out of Egypt, and in Exodus, the whole concept there was the judgment on the, on the Pharaoh and on the Egyptians, right? And on the gods of Egypt, and that was a big point, is judging the gods of Egypt. And it took them from being slaves in Egypt to being free people, but in the wilderness of Sinai, totally dependent on God and getting the tabernacle and things together. And then it ends. And then we pick up with Numbers. And Numbers is the story of their development. It is the story of that 40 years. And so you look at it and you go, all right. It starts out by saying, how many people were there really? So it gives us an idea how big that crowd was. And then it goes through all of the troubles and the difficulties they had and the rebellions and things like that. And it ends on a point where it says, we've had to change some of our uh, customs. But God's given us the path forward. And these daughters are showing an example. Was it possible to just look at what God had said and go, all right, I'm going to do it? And I think that's an, it's a funny little end example. But it's a person, a daughters who said, we're going to follow God. We're going to do what he says. And that finishes the book. So, as we think about the book of Numbers, it's time for you to participate. Yes, go right ahead. Stop being what way? Oh, oh, when did, it, when did the... Uh, you know what's interesting is during the period of the judges, it's very difficult to determine whether or not they even ever honored the Jubilee. Um, what it, it, the period of the judges is so up and down that it's clear that, the, that the, this great momentum that they had going into the land, that's where when you pick up with Joshua, you get this other feeling of momentum, okay? Now they're crossing over, they're conquering the land. And then you get to the book of Judges, and you have that statement that says, and there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
And that's what we've been looking at Wednesday night in that searching for a king. So we had this several hundred years of just turbulence where God had set it up, but because they weren't willing to really follow what God had said, over and over again, God brought them down, raised them back up, brought them down, raised them back up, until we get to the kings. Um, so demonstrated it could be done. Problem is, not many people actually did. So I want to I want you to think back. The book, if you've got one of the little outlines or whatever, I, I thought that might help jog your memory. Um, it's got four or five major sections there. We've got this preparation for the departure from Sinai. We've got this journey from Sinai to Kadesh, 38 years near Kadesh, Kadesh to the plains of Moab, and then Israel in the plains of Moab just before they're ready to launch their uh, cross-Jordan attack uh, as we look at in Joshua to conquer the land. But if you think back on the last several months of studies, what kind of lessons? Anything jump out at you or something that just pops in your head that you remember, you go, huh, a good lesson, hadn't thought about that, or... Yeah, I'm glad he said that again, or whatever. You know, <laughs> what'd you learn? What kind of principles are there? Because if there's not something we can dig out as principles, lessons, then the study's not all that worthwhile. Rick? God upholds his word, and he expects you to. Yeah. What, what examples do you remember from numbers that kind of kind of bring that one out? I think there's several cases. Yeah, that's all right. Somebody help him out. Yeah, Seth? Well, like you said, those are really Go ahead. Do, do your own thing there. Yeah. Um, getting the, that one king that conquered Jericho, and uh, the one uh, that they pushed back four years to come to the Jordan. Yeah, but that's in Judges. I mean, that's in Joshua. You're jumping ahead there. Okay. Yeah, we haven't gotten across the Jordan yet. <laughs> Jericho's on the other side of the Jordan. Good good story there, though. I mean, that's good, but that, that one's a book ahead. Yeah. Okay, and we had Moses, who, as an example of one who was close to God and everything. Well, he was as close as God, but pretty much, and yeah. we had so many examples of the people disregarding, dis disbelieving in God, doing their own thing, you know, and, and, uh, and, and they had this, they might get this one example, just because Moses was no exception, God didn't allow him to disobey. Yeah, I think there's a great example there. Moses was not an exception to the law. He had to obey as well. But what else do we see in that one? That's a good example because, it, you know, did Moses may be frustrated? Did he maybe have, you know, I'm tired of these people? Somebody probably hit that rock. Uh, so how many of us would have hit that rock? I mean, come on. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, and yet, that's not what he was supposed to do. Um, God calls on us to be better, and we're supposed to. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great example. That's, that's one of the stories that we hear as children, and we kind of forget that it comes from numbers sometimes, right? Is 12 spies in the land, they spend time, they come back, and it, and it seals their fate for 40 years. Yeah, our blood, guts, and gore. we got to get that one right. That's, uh, uh, but the zeal of Phineas, you know, here was the replacement for Aaron. And I've often said that Aaron's another great one to, to kind of follow through these. You remember what that passage in Numbers is one of my favorites when we look at Aaron as an example. What did he do? Oh, no, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, the, having an intercessor, someone who can stand between us. And that is what Aaron was doing as well, was he not? He, he took his stand between the living and the dead when the plague came. And we see quite a growth from that man who was the one who um, said, I just threw the stuff in and this calf walked out, you know, uh, all the way to take your censer and stand before God. Uh, so quite, quite a, an amazing uh, growth for Aaron and then to see Phineas, his son, 
He must have learned some lessons there. Probably learned from his brothers, too. There's a couple of others that favor in this story, right? And anybody remember Nadab and Abihu? Uh, yeah, okay, lost them. Uh, but who, again, didn't follow God's law in a circumstance that was very public and very important. And, and I see some also, did you notice that people are held to different levels of things? Um, Moses was held to a pretty high level, was he not? Aaron was held to a pretty high level. And, and you know, Nadab and Abihu and these, they were public, they were figures that were seen there. And, you know, even in the New Testament, we see that, you know, let not many be teachers. You know, that's, that's, a, that's an awesome responsibility that you have uh, to stand up and teach. Uh, and yet, he calls us to do it, right? So it's, it's one of those things you look at it and go, am I safe or not doing it? Am I safe for doing it? It's like, you know, <laughs> you just have to be careful and understand that it's a thing of God. Yeah. It was Miriam who ended up during that re rebellion. Yeah, they were both complaining, and Miriam was the one who had to, to suffer the leprosy for a short time. Um, but again, somebody public who was the leader there, uh, there were consequences of the actions. And I think that's another big one. Seth? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, we look back over the last couple of years. Um, how many of us have, have complained bitterly about COVID? <laughs> <It's like laughs> uh, I, I had to put that up on my door at the office, though, with the, uh, the one with the old Brenner, and it's got the, the, the line underneath, you're complaining about one plague. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's all about perspective, right? Uh, and yet, here we are sitting in a comfortable building complaining about things, um, and, and we don't... And that was their expression, right? We were longing for the good old days. And you know, the older you get, the harder it is not to do that, because we have selective memories. We, we tend to forget the bad things and only remember a few good things, right? And so when you want to get the back to the good old days, the only thing that cures that is having kids. And when your kids are finally grown and out of the house, you look at it and you go, that was great. No, I'm not going back. <laughs> right? <laughs> Revisionist history. And they weren't allowed to revise their history, right? That was it. What other lessons can we learn? Absolutely. Just as Christ was raised up. Yeah, so God's plan is even being foreshadowed there in multiple events. Um, and they are significant events that the people remembered. Uh, when Jesus was talking to uh, the people and teaching, and he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. What bread was he referring to? Manna. All right. That's what we see there in Numbers was how they were being fed and all the rules and regulations about that. So, yeah, very, very good. The, the Numbers has a lot of very uh, uh, projective material that looks forward to that time of Christ. What else? can't be self-willed and still follow God. Great. So who's your good example there? Balaam, right? Uh, so, you know, a lot of us, we looked at it from Balaam and Balak, story that we cried off in here. But to me, it's, that's a story of a fall from grace. You know, there was somebody who was, starts out as one of God's prophets. And where does he end up? He ends up giving advice on how to corrupt the Israelites. There's a fall from grace. And it says that he lost his life because of that. Do you see God's providence anywhere in Numbers? Which story thinks about God's providence? 
manna from heaven, water from rocks. God take care of his people? Took care of his people. I think that's a lesson sometimes that we miss when we are not hungry, and so, you know, we're not looking for our next meal, and if we're thirsty, we live in a country where you can go turn on a tap someplace and, you know, get a drink of water. But does that mean that God's providence is of no use to us? I think we miss that sometimes. And thinking about really strong lesson here in Numbers, God takes care of his people. Now, does that mean that they're always in the best circumstances and nothing ever goes wrong and they've got no problems at all? No. That's not what it means. But we go up to the New Testament and he says, I'll not give you any burden that I know you can't bear. Yeah, God provides. Anything else? Rick? Absolutely. I love that passage. The Lord bless you and keep you. That was that was how they opened up every time, you know, that it was time to address the people. Was the Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah, no, anybody in a position of leadership is going to have to be ready and prepared. And I think it's interesting as you look at how the leaders handled the problems. There were times when Moses was interceding. There were times when Moses was angry at the people. And it depended on the circumstances and what was going on. And every case winds up being different. And, you know, it's... I don't know. Sometimes when I look out and there's no rain and it's kind of a drought, I can imagine the wilderness pretty easily. (laughs) Rob? I think that's a great thing as we start looking at why did they have to number them? Well, I think God wanted them to understand what they had around. They didn't have an organization, what not there, but I already know that number. I know what the number's going to be, right? He, he knew every one of his people. Um, and same today. You know, we don't have to worry about it. God knows his people. He knows his people. What else we got? God can be moved. Yeah, did God ever listen to the prayers of Moses and listen to the prayers of Aaron? And, and it says that he changed his mind. You know, he had, he had, had one path that could have gone. And, and I, I look at it as every one of these stories we've been talking about, sometimes we forget. Does sin have consequences? One of the ways that we learn that sin has consequences is by looking at these kind of stories, right? What did they do? And what happened? My uh, youngest son quite often says that he got in less trouble than the older two because he was wise and watched them. And when they got in trouble, he would think, well, maybe that's not such a good thing to do. Might be some truth to that. It might be the fact that he was third, too. But that's a different story. Uh, But sometimes we can learn from others. And, you know, there's that old saying, if you don't learn from history, what are you destined to do? Repeat it. And have we seen, in uh, essence, the repetition of some of these same things that we ran into in numbers? You know, people that start out one way and end up another, people that don't trust in God, people that do trust in God, all of that, that's, that's all part of the examples that we have. And I love that, that he says, these things were written before time for us as examples. So that's what this book is. It's 
a whole bunch of examples that we can say, how does God deal with people? Well, there they are. And when people do things, is it possible to be forgiven and still have consequences? See, I think that's one of the biggest lessons of this. Because Moses intervened. God said, I'm just going to kill all the people that decided to rebel and not go into the land. He said, Moses, you stand over there, you and Joshua and Caleb, and probably some Levites that would have been with them because they were you know, called out later on. And he said, we'll start over. And Moses begged and he said, please forgive them. God said, I have forgiven them. At your word, I have forgiven them. But there's still consequences. Sometimes we look at forgiveness of sins as almost a get out of jail free card, right? That if God forgives us, then maybe we're not responsible for anything. If someone was a thief and had a house full of stolen stuff and decided to come to Christ, what would be one of the first things they'd have to do? Give it all back, right? It's not like you can go, well, I got a do-over. You know, I can keep all of this, ill-gotten gain. Well, same thing there in, in them. They they rebelled. And as such as said, then you don't get to go. You came out of Egypt, you went all this way, and for 38 years you're going to live in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we have that impatience, don't we? We do not have the patience of God. Uh, and I think we can all sympathize with that. And I would say, yeah, in a lot of the cases, we get this feeling of it being immediate. And yet, how about that person who was just over 20? who had to live for 38 years in the wilderness before he died and was not able to go into the land. That's a little bit delayed as well there too, right? So sometimes God's plan unfolds over time. Everybody knew they were going to die, right? That's okay. So <laughs> how many of them believed it though? You know, that's the, that's the interesting point. But Zelophad's daughters, when they came forward, they said, our father died for his own sins. And so that's another lesson. People are responsible for their own sins. And that shows up in numbers. What else we got? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, they were still going on during Jesus' time. Yeah, you're right. she was asking about the, the daily offerings and all of the other offerings. There were offerings, there was a whole section there on the ones for each of the holidays that they had and how many extra people they had, offerings on the Sabbath and things like that. Uh, and, and yeah, the idea was that would happen every morning and every evening at the tabernacle. And then once the temple was built, it happened at the temple. Um, and that was to go on in per perpetuity. And in fact, it went on, there were some brief hiatuses there were times when it couldn't happen, when they didn't have a temple, when it was destroyed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and they went into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have the ability to offer sacrifices uh, under that system, and then they had to rebuild it and start it up again under Ezra. Um, but by the time they got to 70 A.D. and the Romans destroyed the temple, there was no way to offer those offerings any time after that, and so they they went on until about 70 A.D. Morning and evening. Every morning, every evening. Good point, though, because those are all laid out there in the book of Numbers. And to me, as I look at that river of blood, that's where I start weighing all of that against Jesus and thinking about the sacrifice that we have, that we talked about this morning, being such a different kind of sacrifice and the weight being so much greater uh, than all of that blood that flowed under the old law. Gregorio. This has already been defined by some of the comments, but uh, whenever I look at numbers as a whole, I, one of the lessons that I learned from this book so far is that there's always a time for each of us. Uh, and sometimes I'm really offended whenever you talk about it just being like this end of forever. That's a good point. That's a good point. There was an end. Um, yeah.
Yeah, there's, there's always an end. Um, sometimes it is death, but a lot of times the circumstances would change or, or whatever. So um, the only thing that endures forever, it said, was God's word and our souls. Um, so everything else here is kind of temporary. It's tough for us. We have a timeline, you know, and, and when, when, when the time is ticking, it just seems like everything lasts forever. Um, it gets a little shorter as you grow up, doesn't it, as you get older? Um, everybody remember the, the time warp? Uh, when I was, you know, very, very young, it was at least seven years between Christmases, you know, from one Christmas to the next. It was forever, right? And now... Now, it's about three weeks, you know, and you look back and you go, what happened to this year? <laughs> it's that time of year again to start all over. Uh, but in all instances, God says, I'll take care of you. And the other point that I put up here, God forgives the penitent, doesn't he? The, those who, especially the serpent that uh, Rob brought up, what was it that was going to heal them? Was it just looking at that serpent? It was faith. It was them realizing that they'd done what was wrong and that they needed to look to God, look up, uh, to be forgiven. So God's forgiveness is, is all over the book of Numbers. Um, even the faithful can succumb to temptation. We mentioned that with Moses, right? And that it, we see Aaron and Moses and others that you would just consider to be absolutely God's faithful and so we have no cause to look down on any of them um, but to put ourselves in the place of going what's the right thing to do when we fail it's not if it's when and the right thing to do is what they did which was to come back to God overall and this is one you can put in almost any Old Testament book can't you God keeps his promises sometimes it's not exactly like we wanted to be kept right God said, I'm going to give you the promised land. And so they came out of Egypt with great expectations. And do you think any of them were disappointed in that group that when he said, sorry, you can't go in? Think there was any disappointment there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Complaints. Not fair. I, I can imagine that Moses heard a lot of the, that's not fair. But did God keep his promise? He absolutely did. Well, what we have to do is remember that a lot of God's promises, there's two kinds of promises, right? There's unconditional and conditional promises. And God's made a few unconditional ones. It was an unconditional promise that he would give them the land. The conditional part was who he gave it to, which one of them, because he had a whole lot of descendants to pick from there. Yeah. No, and and uh, to a good point, especially when it says he forgave them of that sin of that rebellion, and so that was not to their account. But the rest of their lives were going to be based on: are they going to have faith in God during that time? So a person who had rebelled, who would turn back to God and from then forward do their best to follow God, could they be forgiven and, and be part of his kingdom? Absolutely. They would have to understand that the consequent was still there. They weren't going to go into the land. But that didn't mean that they couldn't turn and be faithful to God. So we don't get the idea that all of those people over the age of 20 were just absolutely you know, doomed to hell. It's just they had a consequence to their rebellion. It says that each one would be judged based on his own sins, Right? And so that's a concept that is, is very clear there in Numbers as well. Talk about people just for a minute. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Who do you remember in Numbers? And don't tell me Moses and Aaron. All right, I stole the top two. Eliezer, okay, we got a good one there. Yeah, who else? Joshua, Joshua, Joshua. and who else? You, 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 when you say Joshua, you've got to put another name with it, right? Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, you know. We never remember the names of the other ten, but we remember those two names. What's that? 
Miriam was in there. She was a very influential person. And, you know, after they crossed the Red Sea, uh, or uh, she was the one who led the women and, and was a very influential person there. Phineas, you know, another great one with uh, uh, the zeal that he had for God. Korah, yeah. You know, they had a lot of good ones we've named, but there's some names that crop up that you go, ooh, you know, kind of kind of tough there. Korah's rebellion. Um, what was one of the visible results from Korah's rebellion that lasted for a long time? You talk about things to remember. This was something that every time they walked into the tabernacle, they would remember Korah's rebellion. What was it? They took all the brass censers, hammered them out, and plated the altar. So can you imagine that? Every time that you walked in and you looked at that altar, what did you see? You saw the brass censers from Korah's rebellion, and you would remember that. that uh, God gives us memorials, right? And that's one of the things that he wants us to do is remember things. So the brass plating was one. The pile of rocks in various places, they were all things. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and all Seder means is order. It's, it's, it's a prescribed order of events so that they can remember the events that surrounded the Passover. That's the whole idea of that, is to have it scripted and organized so that you, it's burned into your memory. Teach it to the next generation. Next generation. All right. Um, hopefully we've uh, enjoyed the book of Numbers. I know I've enjoyed uh, teaching it. Uh, we're going to do a transition next week. We're going to be starting in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to move over to the New Testament a bit. And we're going to be looking at the letters of Paul. Uh, First and second Thessalonians are fairly short, so we should be able to get through those in uh, May and June kind of time frame. Uh, So if you want to be looking ahead, that would be great. We'll read there. Anything else before we close today? All right. Thank you very much.